Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Frank Moore. I'm the director of the Latin American uh, Caribbean Center. And I really want to welcome you to um, a, a special day uh, and a special event. Not just because we're welcoming back an FIU faculty alum. I'm not sure there's such a thing. But, we'll, but it is uh, the day uh, in which we are officially, so to speak, launching the Brazil Studies Program at, uh, at LAC and, and at FIU. This is uh, one of our priorities. It's one of the programs of excellence that we have identified that we're going to spend resources, attention. We have already been doing that, but in a much more concerted way than perhaps we have um, in the past uh, 18 months or so since I've been here. Um, as you know, um, FIU has a series of, uh, or LAC has a series of programs of excellence. Uh, we have one on governance and security, for example, that we're doing quite a bit of work. And I think that with the Brazil Studies Program that we are establishing here officially today, uh, we'll begin enhancing uh, a, a academic, scholarly, outreach work and programs throughout the university, uh, strengthening our ties, the ties between the FIU, the university, and the Brazilian academic uh, government and uh, private sector institutions. As I said, this will entail uh, active outreach programs whereby LAC will leverage uh, FIU's uh, intellectual and financial uh, resources to not only gauge uh, partners in Brazil, which we've already begun, but to promote and deepen uh, our understanding uh, of Brazil and the United States, Brazil and Florida relations um, here in South Florida. The, the network of relationships between uh, Brazil and the United States, as many of you know, uh, particularly Brazil and Florida, are, are perhaps uh, as dense and as critically important as, as, as one can perhaps imagine between both countries. For instance, uh, and I know many of you know this already, there are about 300,000 Brazilians residing here in, in Florida, which is the largest community uh, of Brazilians in the United States, reflecting in part uh, the significant increase in trade and communication investments between Brazil and the United States, Brazil and Florida. And FIU plans to build upon uh, these strengths in multiple departments and disciplines, such as uh, Portuguese language uh, and Brazilian cultural instruction to promote the, the study and the research of Brazilian language, culture, economy, politics, and society in Florida uh, and the United States. Uh, I think some of you also know that LAC is a Title VI National Resource Center. And as part of our mission, as part of our responsibility, is to, uh, through scholarships, uh, known as FLAS uh, scholarships, to graduate undergraduate students. We provide students the resources to study uh, Brazil, uh, and to more importantly, Portuguese, language instruction. Uh, so for you, your students out there uh, who are looking for scholarship opportunities and to learn and to deepen your knowledge about Brazil and, and, and Portuguese language instruction, please check us out, this opportunity we have for really the next three or, or four years. And we've been doing a lot of work with the community here already through our Title VI National Resource Center with K through 12 programs in Miami-Dade Public Schools. So it is almost natural uh, for us to take advantage of this to, as I said earlier, to focus uh, our attention, our resources, leverage the resources we have at this university across disciplines from history, culture, to biology and chemistry, the environment and so on, that we have so many scholars, so many students doing work in Brazil that, as I said, it's only natural that we officially launch this, um, this program today. To help us do that, um, we have, as I said, um, someone who, who many of us already know. I, I, I didn't know him, I just met him uh, today, but I knew much of his work uh, on, of course, uh, Brazil. Um, Dr. Uh, Timothy Power, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was at Florida International University. He was in the department of what was then still politics? Political, Political science, thank you. Uh, uh, from 1999 to 2005, is that right? 
Uh, he has his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He has taught at uh, Louisiana State University and in 2005 left to become professor of comparative politics of politics at um, Oxford University where he's a, a lecturer in Brazilian studies. As I mentioned, he's very well known in the comparative politics field in areas related to democratic transition in the 1980s, um, issues of democratization and political institutions, and on recent ideological convergences, which is, I find it interesting, uh, in the Cardoso and Lula years. Um, and as I looked around and thought about how best to start this program, uh, I really, it was an easy call for me and for us to reach out and call uh, Dr. Power at, at Oxford University and ask him to start us off, but to also give us a, a lecture on the, on the topic that I think you already know on, on, on the real election of President Dilma Rousseff. So, um, Tim, thank you. Thank you for uh, helping us out here. Uh, great, uh, I know your, your colleagues are delighted to see you back on, on, on this very different campus than when the one you left. Uh, and one last word about um, the Brazil Studies Program. We drafted a white paper, a concept paper, uh, in English and in Portuguese. It will be posted on our website starting, maybe not today, but on Monday, uh, that will lay out some of the things that we hope that we are doing and plan to do in the years to come in this area. So please continue following us on our website, on Twitter, on our Facebook. Uh, Sally, are there other social media tools that we're using uh, to, to do that? And as I said, we have just a wonderful team at LAC that's going to support this. And of course, we have Professor Augusto Bono, who has been leading this process of Brazilian studies for a long time. And I'm, uh, Professor, I'm happy you're here and for all the support you, uh, talking to you, Professor. Yes, <laughs> yes. So she, uh, she has been instrumental. And as I always say, when she asks me something, I always say yes. And we'll continue that tradition. Tim, let me turn it over to you, and thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for this really kind invitation, especially Lack and SIPA for inviting me back to FIU, which is a place that's really changed. This room is identically the same, but uh, <laughs> everything else seems to be different. Uh, I'd like to thank Frank for the invitation and friends, uh, Liesl and Sally and Vivian, everybody in the Latin American Center, colleagues, uh, Eduardo, everybody who's here, Rich, Tatiana, all of my old friends uh, from the Department of, the ex-Department of Political Science and from LAC and former students, it's really nice to see you here. Um, I just need to make a couple disclaimers uh, before I begin. One is that um, I'm extremely jet lagged. <laughs> And it's like uh, 10 o'clock at night for me, so if I fall asleep, I've asked Frank to put some smelling salts under my nose. Um, and secondly, uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, the elections in a, in a Brazil that's coming uh, through kind of a hangover of a fairly polarized election and a, uh, a you know, somewhat of a, um, let's say, a tense political environment over the last few months. And I just wanted to remind everyone that I do not have a chitulo electoral. I don't vote in Brazil. <laughs> so I know that some of you do. I know that my friend Augusta probably doesn't like my first slide very much. Uh, but, <laughs> but I'm going to try to be uh, as impartial as possible and give you uh, my analysis of, of what's happened in the last couple years uh, politically in Brazil. So in the talk, I want to do uh, four things, really. Like, sort of give two kinds of background. One kind of background, which is looking at the overall transformation of Brazil since 1994. The Plano Real, uh, the stabilization of Brazil, I think is the, the deep background uh, for this. And then the immediate context of the 2014 elections uh, based on a, a economy, politics, protests, mega events, et cetera, that shaped the electoral campaign. Uh, then explain the results a bit and conclude by uh, just leaving, hanging in the air, actually, a few challenges for Dilma's uh, second term in office, which we, then, we can then pick up um, in the Q&A. So every Brazilian election is the biggest election in the history of Latin America, right? So uh, that was the case in, uh, in October uh, of this year. Um, not only was the president elected, but there were 27 governors, 27 senators, a third of the Senate, all of the federal deputies, uh, 1,000 state-level deputies, 
This is now the third largest democracy in the world, 143 million voters. The seventh consecutive election uh, held under the constitutional arrangements uh, that came into force in 1988. So this is a, a consolidated democracy. And it's an election that took place in a context of very high level of continuity of personnel, as I'll talk about, the, the same figures dominating uh, politics. Um, I would describe Brazil um, today as a bi-coalitional system, um, not a two-party system, it's far from that. In fact, it's the most fragmented political party system in the democratic world. Uh, 28 parties are represented in Congress, 36 parties are registered. But when I say bi-coalitional, I mean that there are many different configurations of coalitions, but they're basically led by the same two parties. The PT and its allies form one camp, the PSDB and its allies form the other camp. Uh, these are the parties of Lula and of President Cardoso, respectively. Um, they uh, do not have a formal political pact between them. I don't mean to say, when I talk about consensus between these two coalitions, I'm talking about a loose consensus about certain basic points of politics. And I'm also recognizing that some political parties have participated in both of these coalitions. Like, there's many sort of ambivalent parties in Brazil uh, in the literal sense of the term. They, they go from one camp to the other. But um, it's become a system somewhat like Spain or somewhat like Germany. Uh, where you see a lot of different political parties, but you know that every government has to be led by one of two parties, right? That may change in Spain in the next election, uh, but that's been the case in Spain up till now. Um, the five points of consensus that I see between these two coalitions, again, a loose consensus. One is the basic lines of macroeconomic policy have pretty much been in place since the late 90s, uh, and Lula inherited most of the main lines of the Cardoso economic uh, policy, uh, floating exchange rate, uh, fiscal surplus, et cetera. Secondly, social policy, although people uh, in, in the news, on the internet and news media, et cetera, criticize social policies, there's a broad consensus in Brazil that the social safety net developed over the past 20 years is something that would not be reversed by any incoming government. Uh, Bolsa Familia, the uh, minimum wage policy that's in place, are pretty, pretty secure politically. Um, a revised federal equilibrium, by which I mean since 1994, Brazil has re-centralized uh, its federal system uh, and limited the power of state governments and governors to blackmail the federal government. So that uh, the, the Cardoso government did most of the dirty work on that, and uh, Brazil has been a much more, uh, let's say, functional federal system in the last 10 years than it was in the 90s. Okay. Um, a fourth point of, of consensus is basically how to govern. What is the, the, the hardware that you use to govern the country? I would call that um, very secure as coalitional presidentialism. Brazilian presidents have learned that they need to behave like European prime ministers. They form coalition governments. They share power in the cabinet. They transfer resources to friendly parties. They punish parties that don't support them. It works very much like a coalitional parliamentary system, not very different from Italian or Israeli politics, but with an elected president. And Cardoso, I, I would say, is the person who uh, wrote the user's manual for this, really. Uh, he's the one who, who uh, developed the system with his alliance with the PSDB and the PFL in the 90s. Lula copied it with his alliance with the PMDB, and uh, it's a very similar structure today. A fifth point, which I won't go into today because I'm talking about domestic politics today, but a fifth point of consensus is that both camps believe that Brazil was punching below its weight uh, in international politics previously, and both camps have been uh, very bent on uh, uh, increasing Brazil's status as an emerging uh, power, right? So uh, although there's different uh, uh, emphases in foreign policy, clearly the uh, Lula and Dilma governments more closer to the left-wing populist governments of South America, they both have very similar policies towards international organizations and global governance. Um, here's a picture illustrating something of the consensus, right? How many, in how many Latin American countries could you take a picture like this <laughs> of the living ex-presidents? I would say that there's only a handful. Um, some would be dead, some would be living in Miami, uh, some would be in jail. Uh, and uh, some uh, would not be on speaking terms. Uh, maybe in Uruguay, Chile, you could do this. Uh, Colombia, not anymore. Uh, you know, you, but <laughs> Brazil is a place where the, uh, 
where the, the, the ex-presidents have a role in political life and you have all of them collaborating on major initiatives. This picture was taken two years ago at the announcement of the Truth Commission, uh, which investigated crimes of the dictatorship, and all five presidents stood behind uh, Jilma, or four, the four other presidents stood behind Jilma as she signed the legislation to show that that was a policy of the state and not of the uh, government. So Collar, Sarney, uh, Lula, uh, Jilma, and Cardoso dominating the, the political system for the last 20 years, 25 years. Since the Plano Real in the mid-90s, um, Brazilian performance in social policy, economic policy, everything has improved. Uh, it hasn't had the dramatic improvements that you saw between, say, 2004 and 2010, where the kind of golden years of the Lula era boom. But in general, uh, I don't know how well you can see that from where you're sitting, but um, literacy, uh, minimum wage, uh, political freedoms, uh, infant mortality, every, and every, every indicator of Brazil has done a lot better than it did under the first 10 years or so of democracy. 85 to 93 was a very poor uh, start for democracy in Brazil. 94 from beyond, it's almost a different country. And it's taken place in a, a context of incredible stability. I was very curious um, when, when Brazil just changed its finance minister um, in January. Uh, to see, you know, what countries had the, f the most continuity in their finance ministry over the last 20 years. And I did this little table of the major economies in the world. Brazil actually had the most stability in uh, economic uh, leadership over the past 20 years of any major country. If you go back to the Collor or Sarney period, um, the average tenure of, of Collor's uh, finance, or, or Itamar Franco's finance ministers was about 90 days. I think he had seven of them, you know. It was a very different Brazil. The last 20 years, three people uh, ran the economy, okay? And this has been, uh, you know, sort of validated by the polls, by the, uh, by the results of elections. The country does not reject this bicoalitional system, because if they did, you wouldn't see a table like this, right? It's a country that has the most fragmented party system in the world, and yet two parties are consistently the same presidential contenders, right? Only two parties have presidenciaves. Uh, really, uh, you know, they, the PT and PSTB jointly have received as the two-party vote, let's say, between 75 and 90 percent on every occasion, right? So if the country were opposed to this bicoalitional system, you would have seen outsider politics or a breakthrough of these kinds of numbers. It's true that the PT and PSTB still only control about a quarter of Congress. It's also true that the PT has not grown at all since it took power in 2002. In fact, it's slightly smaller than it was in 2002. But presidentially, it's a force, as you can see. They've won four times in a row. So I think if you want to tell the, the recent history of a country and you want to tell the story of the political economy of a country, a good way to do it is just by looking at poverty rates. They tell you a lot about the recent history of a country. So let me just run you through this transformation I'm talking about. Uh, in the debt crisis in the early 1980s, about half of Brazilians lived under, uh, under the poverty line. The red line here is the poverty line. Green is extreme uh, poverty, both calculated by IPEA. Um, after the Plano Cruzado in 1986, this was halved, but that was a very short-lived uh, stabilization program. And then it returned sort of regressed to the mean. I'm sorry, I went backwards. Uh, in the hyperinflation between 1987 to 1993. Uh, that was, I think, the worst period of Brazilian democracy, a period in which there were four different currencies. Average inflation was 2,500% a year in those six years. Okay, um, inflation now is 6.5 percent, and Brazilians are panicking about it. It's a very different country. Okay, uh, under the eight years of Cardoso, um, from '95 to 2002, poverty was reduced after the Plano Real, because inflation is a tax on the poor. When Cardoso eliminated inflation, poverty rates fell, uh, but they basically stayed at the same level under Cardoso for eight years, about 35 to 36 percent. So there was really no movement there uh, under Cardoso. Um, but then beginning with the Lula experiment, uh, beginning in 2003, um, followed by uh, Jilma's continuation of his policies, you see the poverty rate dipping down to something like 15 percent now, which is a, a major uh, achievement for any developing country, uh, let alone one with the, the challenges that Brazil had in the 80s. Okay? If we were to look at something like the real minimum wage, which is in red uh, in this graph, 1980 to 2012, or household income, which is in blue, they've also shown incredible improvement over the last uh, 12 years. You can see that prior to Lula, they did not really move in sync, but since 2003, they're very closely related to one another. 
it's because the minimum wage policy is on autopilot. Minimum wage in Brazil is raised every year above the rate of inflation, and it has become the main determinant of household income. Uh, another factor in this, if you've all heard of this, is that the biggest and most successful conditional cash transfer program in the world, which is called Bolsa Familia, or Family Grant. Um, this is uh, a federal program in which uh, heads of household are paid a monthly stipend in return for keeping their children in school and keeping them vaccinated. Um, this has uh, been very successful because it was rolled out extremely fast and extremely effectively. It's run by a team in the Ministry of Social Development, which can't be larger than the, the number of people in this room, and yet it's able to um, sort of provide a basic in income to 14 million families. And these 14 million families comprise a quarter uh, of the Brazilian uh, population. Okay? But Bolsa Familia, contrary to what many of us think, is not the main driver of the reduction of poverty or inequality in Brazil. If you decompose this, as economists have done, you'll find that income from work is actually the biggest uh, expl explanatory factor. Actually, it's the minimum wage has had a bigger effect on reducing poverty and inequality than Bolsa Familia has. And a graph like this is encouraging. Um, there Inequality and human development are both measured on the same index, zero to one. And it, you see the blue line, human development in Brazil rising. Nothing really impressive about that because it's rising everywhere all the time around the world. Latin America has a, uh, an increasing uh, Im you know, improvement on, on human development. But what's really encouraging here is the Gini coefficient of income inequality, um, which Brazil has always been a champion in income inequality in the world. And this has been falling steadily since the early uh, 2000s. It's not something you would ne necessarily write home about. Uh, if you were uh, in 2000, the third most unequal country in the world, and today the 15th most unequal country in the world, um, there's still 180 countries before you hit Norway. Uh, but if you uh, believe, like many, many of us did, that inequality was intractable in Brazil, then the fact that there's really movement on this line for the first time is really encouraging. It's a psychological breakthrough for, for Brazilians to believe that inequality could actually be diminished, right? Because it did not happen in the entire history of data collection, okay? So to sum up on this part, um, this is one of the most rapidly changing societies in the world in terms of its class structure. And when I say class here, I'm using the Brazilian uh, definition of class, which is not a social class, but rather a consumption class. Uh, Brazilians use the marketing industry's uh, terminology of class A, B, C, D, and E, which uh, basically refers to purchasing power and consumption potential of consumers. Um, and if you look at 2003, which is on the left, you can see that the, um, the class C, the C class, which is the so-called emerging middle class in Latin America, families that have between $1,000 and $3,000 a month, something like that. Uh, this was about uh, 66 million people in 2003. It's over 120 million people today. It's doubled in size in a period of uh, 12 years. This is a, a Chinese transformation, right? This is what people call in Brazil, crescimento chinês. Uh, this is a, a doubling of the new middle class. And 120 million people is the population of Mexico or Japan, right? I mean, this is a, a very large segment of Latin Americans. And these are people entering the internal market as consumers uh, for the first time, okay? So they don't have a class consciousness in the sociological sense. They don't have a Hedge Globo or a Veja magazine that speaks for the classice. They don't have a political party that speaks for the classice, but they are present uh, in, in moving the Brazilian economy on a daily basis, okay? So after 12 years of pro-poor policies and these numbers I've been showing you, what happened politically? Let me take you back to 2002. This is the year in which the PT broke through to win the presidency for the first time. The candidates that year were Lula and José Serra of the PSTB, who was aiming to succeed Cardoso. Lula is in red, Serra is in blue in this graph. And what you can see is they competed across the national territory in a fairly uneven way. There's not a clear pattern in this graph. Uh, it's, a, it's a contested election that looks uh, very disparate. There's a couple other candidates that year Anthony Garocino in yellow, uh, Ciro Gomez in purple, they won their home states, but the main, uh, the main focus was between Lula and Sierra. So it was a divided Brazil and one that did not have clear regional patterns. What happens to Brazilian politics after four years of the PT in power, four years of pro-poor policies? This is what you see in 2006. 
you see a realignment, a spatial realignment of the vote, uh, which shows basically what you're looking at here on the screen is a map of poverty in Brazil, almost perfectly. All right, this, this map looks like a map of human development. If I were to show you the HDI for Brazil, it would look very similar to this. So there's a massive presidential realignment in which poor voters gravitate to the PT and the traditional middle class remains firmly in the camp of the uh, PSDB, okay? In 2010, uh, the candidates were uh, Jilma Hussafi, um, seeking to defend Lula's two victories, and uh, José Serra again. And uh, again, the map is uh, very similar. If I go, this is 2006 when Lula wins re-election, 2010 with Jilma, basically the same map, except she does a bit better in the far south where she had um, spent some of her career. So basically, the PT gains in Brazil, but it gains in the areas where the poor uh, are mathematically, you know, superior, right? So this is just a graph of Brazilian states. On the y-axis, you're looking at the swing towards the PT under Lula, and on the x-axis, you're looking at human development. There's almost a perfect relationship there. If I were to look at the, uh, the belt line of the graph, the zero line of the graph, these states here, the PT has not done any better at all in the last 12 years. Sao Paulo, the PT has made no advances, Paraná, no advances. Uh, in certain developed states like Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Catarina, and the Distrito Federal, which is the wealthiest, uh, the PT is doing worse, okay? But uh, in the northeast, in the north of the country, the PT's uh, gained a uh, 40% swing. I mean, a 40% swing in a presidential election that where the is usually one with 41% or something, or 42%, is an incredible swing uh, anywhere, okay? So there's been a, a realignment uh, in presidential elections. This realignment is not replicated in congressional elections, gubernatorial elections, et cetera. It's a presidential uh, phenomenon. We can come back to why um, that's the case. Okay, so why have I talked so much about legacies? Um, basically because I think that the 2014 campaign was a battle between two uh, legatees or two, uh, you know, legacies that were put before the Brazilian public. Um, the candidates linked themselves directly to their predecessors. Ayasio Neves uh, clearly linked himself to the Cardoso period of government and Jilma, of course, is the, is the creation, the political creation uh, of Lula, right? So let me give you three stereotypes about those two legacies, Cardoso versus Lula. Okay. First, the legacy of Fernando Henrique Cardoso was economic stabilization. The legacy of Lula was social inclusion. Okay. Cardoso was reform without redistribution. Lula was redistribution without reform. Okay. Uh, Cardoso was a government of reforms. Lula was a government of programs. Now, think about the difference. Reforms, as Cardoso did, privatization, liberalization, deregulation, they required constitutional amendments, three-fifths majorities in both House Congress, politically painful, expenditure of a lot of political capital to get those things through. Programs are run out of federal ministries with technocrats and a budget. Like I said, Bolsa Familia is run by a group of people, about as many as we are here, and it, you know, it feeds families, right? Uh, sort of privatizing the, uh, I don't know, the telecoms industry <laughs> was a different political animal altogether. Uh, so uh, Cardoso spent uh, a lot of political capital on unpopular measures to a certain extent. Lula spent small amounts of political capital on very popular measures, right? So of course this explains a bit of the uh, realignment as well. These are three stereotypes. I happen to believe that all three stereotypes are true. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, in terms of the context of uh, 2014, now I'm moving to the immediate context. I'll talk about three things here. The economy, the protests, and the uh, mega events. Okay, first of all, we know that the Brazilian boom is over. We know that the economy has slowed down. Growth last year was about 0.15% or something like that. Um, but did it matter for the election? Um, it clearly mattered for uh, the uh, traditional middle class, people with university educations who uh, are in a position to evaluate economic statistics, who, who might read The Economist or uh, Valor Economico and things like this, who know the macro statistics. For ordinary Brazilians, they were still feeling the, the sort of slowing but still present um, 
uh, cushion of that consumption boom that I mentioned earlier, right? It was petering out in 2014, but even though the economy was growing at 0.1%, personal incomes were growing between 6 and 8% because of the social policy and, and minimum wage. So what Brazilians say now is, o povo não sente o pibinho, right? The pibinho is the little GDP, right? That Dilma has been producing a very small pibinho. And uh, people don't feel the pibinho like they used to uh, because the pibinho is delinked from personal spending, <laughs> personal incomes and household incomes, right? So the presence of a social safety net and a, and a very progressive minimum wage policy shields the government candidate from poor macroeconomic results. If Cardoso had had these economic results, he would have been ruined politically because these policies were not in place in the 90s, right? In fact, there's even political scientists who have simulated uh, what, you know, uh, what Cardoso's popularity would have been under Lula's economic conditions. That's quite impressive. Uh, so what's going on here? Minimum wage going up, uh, Bolsa Familia is there, but I, one factor I haven't mentioned, which is credit, okay? This class is had never touched the credit market until about 10 years ago, right? In the last five to 10 years, uh, the expansion of so-called crédito popular, which means lending to the poor, uh, it, it's, it's a new phenomenon uh, in Brazil. So uh, you can now, for example, buy a, a television or an appliance or something like that on a loan, and the retailer uh, gets to deduct the payments directly from your salary, so there's no uh, payment booklets or anything like this. It's a very strong guarantee to the retailer. Um, it seems very painless to the consumer. Um, so consumption has boomed on this crédito popular. To give you a statistic, if you're an economist, you'll be very worried by this statistic, but when Lula took power in 2003, outstanding credit as a share of Brazilian GDP was about 23%. Right now, it's almost 60%, 12 years later, right? Most of that new credit is actually to first-time borrowers. They've never defaulted before because they've never borrowed before, right? So Brazil doesn't know what a credit bubble is. That's why I'm saying it in the microphone, so that <laughs> people will realize that there's something, there's a sort of Damocles hanging over this miracle, and it's really uh, credit. Um, but the boom for the consumption is still going on. For example, in the year 2011, 10 million Brazilians got into an airplane for the first time in their lives, according to an industry survey. That's one whole Portugal entering an airplane, not one airplane, of course, <laughs> for the first time uh, in their lives, right? In, in, a, in a country like Brazil, uh, air travel is important, right? So th these are the kinds of things that have transformed people's lives. In a country of uh, 203 million people, there's 280 million active cell phone lines uh, in Brazil. I have two of them, so I'm partly responsible. <laughs> but. Um, the, uh, this is a consumption revolution that I, I'm saying is shielding the ordinary voter from bad macro performance, okay? But in the upper middle class and in the offices of The Economist magazine or The Wall Street Journal, this is the kind of thing you see, uh, which is that the inflation targeting regime set up by Cardoso, maintained by Lula, uh, was beginning to crack around the time of the election. In fact, for the first time, the maximum tolerance ban of inflation was exceeded in September, one month before the election. But really, that had very little impact politically uh, or electorally. Uh, Aécio Neves tried to use it in, in campaign, uh, but most people at the, you know, at the, uh, who formed the majority of the electorate would not be affected so much by that. Now, all of you are familiar with the protests that er erupted in Brazil in the middle of 2013. They started in Sao Paulo over public transport fares, but they spread in, into a very diffuse movement. Okay, so this, this photo, I think, captures the diffuseness <laughs> of the movement, <laughs> if you look at the posters. My favorite one is this one here, which says, e, e tanta coisa que não cabe nesse cartaz. <laughs> okay? <laughs> which is, uh, it's so much that I can't fit it on my poster. So, uh, but you can see it's animal rights, uh, political amnesty, re political reform, uh, you know, everything. Um, so, I'm not here to talk about whether the, the, the protests were important for Brazilian identity or political culture, they certainly were. But I'm here to talk about whether they're important for the election, and I didn't see a directional effect of these protests in the election for several reasons. One is no clear agenda, right? And this is not like the protests in Chile, which are about one policy, education or unemployment in Spain. Um, this was very diffuse. 
Uh, secondly, the cost of mobilization is very low. This is one of the most wired societies uh, on the earth. So if you, you know, people were comparing these, these protests to the Gireta Ja protests of 1984. To me, that's a ludicrous comparison. Getting a million people into uh, the Praça da Sé in Sao Paulo in 1984 was a political achievement. Um, today, with you know, Twitter and Facebook, getting you know, a million people is really a low cost uh, operation, right? So the cost of mobilization means that you need to discount these things politically. And third, there was no political leader or organization that emerged from these protests, zero. Right? If I go back to Gireta Ja, there were several politicians who made their names, who became politicians, uh, main figures in the country. If I even went back to Collar's impeachment, the protests that led to Collar's impeachment produced uh, somebody who was a candidate for governor of Rio this year. These protests uh, produced no one and no organization. Right? So it did not have a directional effect on the election. The only thing I would say is that Marina Silva, in her brief sojourn into the presidential campaign, tried to embody the contrarian spirit of the protests, but without uh, too much sex success there. Okay? Did the World Cup matter? Well, this is a protest uh, by, uh, uh, by a person who, an, uh, a performance artist who was saying that, uh, that the Congress shouldn't have been spending millions on the, uh, the games preparation. He put 594 soccer balls one for each member of Congress, and they all have uh, a cross in blood marked on them. It's a beautiful <laughs> photograph. Most people watch TV instead, instead looking at this. Um, but uh, most people thought that the, that the uh, organization would be terrible and the football would be beautiful. Uh, it actually turned out to be exactly the opposite. Uh, but in, uh, this soured <laughs> the country a bit, uh, but not in a directional way. I mean, people didn't chant Fora Gilma because of the German victory, um, but uh, it did not have a, the expected political effect. It would have had an effect had they won, I think, but uh, since it was, the, the loss was so tragic, uh, let's say. Um, another bit of context, we need to think about Latin America as a whole. We need to think about what re-election means in Latin America, right? Uh, Eduardo probably knows the statistic, but it's something like maybe 17 or so presidents have tried re-election since it was relaxed. Uh, in the 90s, and I think 16 have won. I think Hippolyto Mejia was in Dominican Republic was the only one. Uh, if you count Ortega in 1990, which I wouldn't count, but that would be another case. Um, but basically, uh, the incumbency is a powerful advantage anywhere, but it's tremendously powerful in societies like Latin American societies. And so in Brazil, 65% of mayors who try re-election win. 70% of governors who try it win. And now we know 100% of presidents who try it win, because Cardoso, Lula, and Gilma have all done it, and they've all won comfortably, actually. So, I mean, it, it gives rise to continuity, whether you like it or not. Brazil now has three consecutive re-elected presidents, which means that Brazil is going to complete a cycle of 24 years with three leaders, right? Has this ever been achieved in the world before? Well. It's only been achieved twice, with uh, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, who were reelected, and then, uh, of course, uh, Bush, Clint uh, Clinton, Bush, and Obama were reelected. But Cardoso, Lula, and Gilmer is only the third example in the history of the world where three presidents were reelected for two terms. Okay. Now, if you go back to Gilmer's popularity, a lot of people thought she was a weak and vulnerable incumbent. Not so. She was actually entering her final year of the, in office with a stronger approval rating than Cardoso had in his final year or Lula had in his final year. So uh, people uh, did not really interpret the numbers very well. She had a base. She had a base as she walked into this year. So finally, let's turn to people. Let's turn to the candidates. Um, I think you're familiar with all of the main players. Juma Hussef from the PT, Marina Silva from the, uh, what was the party she ran for? Uh, PSB this year, well, this year, PSB, who substituted the man next to her, Eduardo Campos, uh, the PSB governor of Pernambuco, who died tragically uh, in a plane crash on uh, August 13th. Um, he was a, a very talented politician, obviously a future leader of Brazil. This was not his year. He would not have won. Uh, he probably would have 10, 12 percent or something like that, but a very gifted uh, person that was a, a loss. Uh, and Aécio Neves, um, grandson of the president who took office, uh, did not take office 30 years ago, uh, Tancredo Neves. Uh, now, what's interesting is you think about the origins of these people. Um, Aesio and Eduardo were both 
uh, children of oligarchs or grandchildren of oligarchs. They come from traditional families in Minas uh, in Pernambuco, right? Tancredo Neves, grandfather, president of Brazil. Uh, Miguel Ajais, the grandfather of Eduardo Campos, a leader in Brazil in the mid uh, 20th century. But then look at Marina and Gilma. Where did they come from? They came from Lula's cabinet, right? They came from the PT. And they came from the experience of the PT winning power, right? They did not come through these other political ladders. That's quite interesting. Here's a strange statistic. Gilma was challenged by 10 candidates this year. There were 11 candidates, 10 of them running against her. Six of them are former members of the PT. This tells you a lot. It tells you that when a, a, a political party wins power, it creates conditions for this kind of um, you know, legacy. So turning to the results, um, Gilma's popularity took a huge plunge in the, uh, during the protests of 2013, in which she responded to very, very poorly. Uh, her, her public response was not very good. They recovered at the beginning of the year, but then uh, due to bad economic news and uh, some problems with preparations for the cup, perhaps there was a dip in the early part of the year. But what people really didn't perceive is that television, uh, when it was made available to the candidates, would change this, right? Brazilian candidates get free television time. When Gilma started uh, her television time, she began to recover her popularity pretty quickly. She had a negative spread at the end of the World Cup. By the beginning of the first round, she was, uh, had a positive spread of 13 percentage points of popularity. Okay? And uh, of course, Marina Silva entered the race a few days after of Campos' death. This graph shows you the average popularity for Gilma in red, Marina in green, I'm not very original with my choice of colors. And blue uh, for uh, Aesio Nevis. And you can see that uh, Marina Silva started off really strong. When she jumped into the race, people were telling Aesio Nevis, you, you got to get out. You got to go back to Minas and run for governor. You still have a chance. Save your career while you can. You know? <laughs> um, but Marina, uh, her support was a mile wide and an inch deep. Right? She had no political uh, organization on the ground. She is not a good campaigner. She was not able to found her own party. Uh, she couldn't get enough signatures. For we knew a lot uh, about her, her uh, weaknesses as a candidate, and they became very apparent. Um, but ISO didn't pass her until about 96 hours before the election. But when he did pass her, he absolutely crushed her on the first round day because he finished, how much is it? Uh, something like... Uh, 12 points ahead of Marina. So there was a huge shift. In, in the last week before the first round, about one to two million votes a day were shifting away from Marina towards Aesio, which I, I took to mean that people who were, who were wanting to get the PT out of power, the hardcore opposition, decided that they would prefer the, you know, the premium gasoline rather than the unleaded version, right? They wanted the, the strong uh, opposition and that was uh, the more authentic opposition with a party was Aesio Nevis. So here's the map from 2014, and it looks a lot <laughs> like the maps I showed you for the previous years, right? Gilma does very well in the poorer regions of the country. This takes uh, all 5,570 municipalities of Brazil and plots them by vote and HDI. So without boring you too much, you can't see these numbers. But in a municipality in Brazil with an HDI of 8, which would be like Portugal or Poland or something like that, um, uh, Gilma could expect about 10% of the vote, okay? In a municipality with a HDI of uh, 5, which would be like Haiti, uh, Gilma would, could expect 70 to 80% of the vote, right? In political science, we don't usually get graphs that are that beautiful, okay? I didn't make those graphs. I copied them from someone else, but uh, it's an amazing uh, indication of class voting in the presidential election. And if I did it by Bolsa Familia, it's almost the exact same uh, pattern, okay? But Ayesio Neves, it has to be said, did very well to come against a popular incumbent with a, the machine like this and come away with 48% of the vote uh, in the runoff. People were writing off his party, which I think was premature. You have to remember that the PSDB led by Ayesio Neves still controlled the government of Sao Paulo, the government of Minas Gerais, and several other state governments. Half of the Brazilian GDP was in states run by his party. So he had um, a pretty substantial base to run for the presidency. And if you were to look at individual level correlates of the vote, you probably can't see those numbers, but basically education, 
is inversely correlated with the JILMA vote. Income is inversely correlated with the JILMA vote. Um, and uh, the minimum wage, of course, is a very strong predictor of it. JILMA did much better among women voters this time than she did uh, four years ago. Four years ago, Seha actually did better. Um, and she was able to use that television time in the final days to improve her, uh, to sell her achievements, uh, to talk about the, uh, the plans for the second term. Importantly, to have a friend of hers every night on television, um, that was Lula, who was <laughs> on, on the TV program every night, practically. Uh, and that made a big difference. Uh, so in the second round, um, although it was very close, uh, Jilma won the election by about three and a quarter uh, percentage points. Okay, but 51% um, of the vote, the same as Obama, the same as Francois Hollande, very similar. Um, but the uh, closest election in modern Brazilian history. There's no election that was this close before. So let me just finish up by uh, raising a few questions for Jilma's uh, second term, and then we can have some Q&A. Um, the first question I think here is that um, Brazil comes out of this election, you know, kind of a house divided. Um, a polarized society in which uh, I know from personal experience, people, families, marriages breaking up over the second round <laughs> vote, people not talking to each other, uh, terrific genocidal wars on Facebook. Um, so it was uh, a, a very, very difficult uh, campaign. Um, what is Jilma going to do to reach out to the opposition? Because Ayesio Neves is still a senator. He still leads the PSTB. Uh, the PSTB still controls Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo still controls 23% of the electorate, 38% of the GDP. So, I mean, Jilma has to reach out uh, to the opposition. Second challenge here, we know that the boom is over economically, right? Uh, Brazil um, has this pibinho. Um, this shows Lula's performance versus Jilma's performance. Jilma has, of all Brazilian presidents over the last 100 years, Jilma has the second worst growth performance of any president. Only Fernando Collor had lower uh, GDP growth in his presidency than uh, Jilma did. Okay. A third challenge, uh, which I'm sure you've all been hearing about, um, is what's in Brazil called Operação Lava Jato, or the Petrobras uh, scandal. Uh, a, uh, a scheme was uncovered uh, in which kickbacks to uh, contractors was discovered in the oil monopoly. It looks like the uh, Proceeds from some of the kickbacks were funneled back to political parties, including the PT uh, and the PMDB. Most of this occurred earlier, uh, but it occurred in periods when Jilma was actually legally the head of the Petrobras Council when she was uh, Minister of Mines and Energy and Chief of Staff uh, for Lula. So like most scandals, every day we have new revelations, new uh, details. I'm not going to go into the minutia. We could talk about that. Um, but this has been a huge blow to her credibility. Because Jilma, let's face it, Jilma is a technocrat. Jilma is all about infrastructure. Uh, Jilma is all about administration. Um, if one thing were to go wrong for her, it should not be this, because, I mean, she was, after all, the, the Minister of Mines and Energy. A third challenge here, political reform. This is something that we hear every four years after an election in Brazil. How are we going to strengthen parties? How are we going to reduce the fragmentation? How are we going to avoid a situation in which there are 28 parties in Congress and the biggest party has 15% of the seats? Are there ways to do this? Um, hey, forma politica means different things to different people. To a political scientist like me, it means constitutional changes, electoral system changes, and other boring details, right? To an ordinary Brazilian citizen, it means something different. It means que se vayan todos, right? It means like, uh, you know, sweeping out the bums, uh, ending corruption, et cetera. And to politicians, it means regulation of their workplace. <laughs> so to politicians, hey, forma politica is a, very, uh, is a term that really uh, makes people's hair stand on end because, after all, these are politicians who were elected under these rules. So if they were elected under these rules, they probably don't want to change them, right? So this is the, the sort of inertia of Brazilian political institutions. If you want to approve political reform in Brazil, uh, reform of the electoral system, you'd have to be able to manage a government coalition uh, which controls Congress to approve that. And uh, this is just a, a survey I did last year, 2013, with 150 legislators, uh, and we asked them, uh, compared to Lula, how would you rate Jilma's ability to manage uh, relations with the pro-government parties? Overwhelmingly, 
members of Congress think that Jilma is much less uh, able or successful than Lula was at managing uh, the coalition. Like I said, she is not a glad-handing, you know, back-slapping politician. She's not a natural politician. That's Lula. Jilma is about a sort of, you know, uh, central planning and infrastructure and, and you know, uh, she's a micromanager, but not of politics, right? And so I think she kind of lacks the political skills that would be necessary to, to push this through. And finally, this is looking ahead to next year. Um, the media attention focused on Brazil next year will be greater uh, during the uh, Olympic Games, which will only be in one city as opposed to 11 cities for the World Cup. Uh, most of the fate of Jilma will be really in the hands of these people, the, the local leaders of Rio, like Eduardo Paes, the mayor, but again, Gilma's uh, investments in Rio as uh, the uh, chief of staff of Lula are part of the legacy of the games uh, as well. So uh, things could go wrong there. And of course, the reputational bath that Brazil could take from uh, a poorly managed Olympics, uh, whether it's a polluted Guanabara Bay or a fish kill in the Lagoa or whatever could go wrong, uh, would accrue um, to her. So, there are reasons to suspect that the second term of Jilma Hussefi will be a very difficult one uh, for her as an incumbent. So with that, um, and I'm at 41 minutes and 38 seconds, I will, <laughs> I will stop here. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Tim. That was really wonderful. Before we go to the, uh, to the q and I just want to make sure I introduce our friends and colleagues from the, the Consul General, uh, Bruno Abreu and Luis Corey, thank you for, for being here on this special day. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize our Dean from the School of Journalism, Raul Reyes. Uh, thank you, Dean, for being here. Okay, um, so we have some time uh, for Q&A. Yes, sir, please, uh, if you could just identify yourself. And if, I'm sorry, we have mics because we are filming, so uh, it's important that we record it. If you. Uh, let, before you speak, the, the technicians are saying no. So if you don't mind going to the mic. Thank you so much. Working? Yeah. I'm Ira Brin. I uh, worked many years as a professor in Rio and in, in uh, Pernambuco. Um, you did a very good job of tracing the effect of economics on politics, and you spoke very little about the effect of education on economics, especially at the university level. Uh, I'd like to hear a few words from you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are structural problems in the Brazilian higher education sector that I'm sure that you're aware of and many of us are aware of that um, it's essentially the, the system is biased towards giving the places at the competitive federal universities uh, to students who uh, were able to purchase high quality private secondary education, right? This is a problem that we've known about in Brazil for a long period of time. The vestibular system uh, advantages people who, uh, who come from upper middle class. If you take a, a university like USP, which is the best in Latin America, according to the Times Ed Education Supplement, about 40% of the students at USP come from the top 10% of the income distribution. This, this is something that it's an old uh, problem uh, in Brazil. So there's been two responses to this. One is that uh, beginning with Cardoso, but accelerating under Lula, um, the expansion of a alternative private higher education sector, um, which are basically for-profit uh, universities, mainly on the periphery of cities with part-time faculty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this uh, has been met with uh, mixed results, I would say, in terms of, of quality. Um, and the, uh, the second response has been what Jilma uh, did in her first term, which is to, and I'm sure everyone at FIU is familiar with the Science Without Borders program, which is to try to, to leverage uh, foreign education, uh, elite universities around the world through directly paid scholarships, right? But that's higher education. That's what I'm interested in because I work in higher education. 
most of the problems that seem to be most intractable are actually, you know, well below that, right? So um, the, the, the big achievements in the last 10 to 15 years have been student retention in primary and secondary school. These numbers have increased dramatically. I think it was in the first slide I showed. But the quality of this uh, primary and secondary education has uh, lagged uh, well behind. So, I mean, I'm not saying anything new. Uh, we, I think we're all aware of, of this kind of diagnosis. I think that the Jilma government does deserve praise, though, for adopting a less sort of protectionist uh, approach to higher education and recognizing that uh, Brazilians uh, should be mobile to travel abroad to acquire, um, you know, a better education. The other one, uh, if I could make one footnote about this, everyone has heard of Mais Magicos, right? Mais Magicos is a, is a program um, in which uh, the Jilma government proposed um, uh, essentially uh, importing doctors from abroad. <laughs> and of course there's one country that exports a lot of doctors. <laughs> uh, and uh, this was very unpopular with the uh, medical profession, but in a way uh, I think it's one of the first serious attempts to, uh, to uh, attack some of the entrenched elitism in the system because up until now uh, Brazilian doctors have had an excellent education and solid public universities, and many of them just take the diploma, stick it under their arm, walk across the street, open up a private consultorio, and start charging people for it without uh, paying back any sort of that value back to the union, back to the, to the political system, right? And so as long as that problem exists, <laughs> the government has the right to counter it uh, by uh, importing other doctors. That, that would be my view. I think there was yes, please, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Diego Sombrano. I am a PhD student in the International Relations Program. I have two questions, and one is, uh, maybe you could address it later, because it's about the role of Brazil in the region, and I know that you dedicated some time on domestic politics. So the first one, the, the other one is regarding the role of the inexperience of Marina in cementing Dilma's victory. While I was following the race, especially after the first round, a lot of people were saying, well, the fact that Marina lost is giving Dilma the victory because if she won the first round, Neves' opposition would have voted for Marina since they opposed uh, Dilma. But it, since it was Neves, the one who was going for election head to head with Dilma, the, the basis of Marina were mostly PT. So they wouldn't vote for PSDB. And therefore, the inexperience of Marina is what ultimately secures the election for Dilma Rousseff and her not being able to continue to the second round. What is your assessment on these? And more importantly, does the numbers, the electoral polling, especially after the elections, show that this swing happened, that the core of the Marina followers returned to PT or they didn't vote or they moved to Neves? What's your assessment on that? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm glad you, you gave me a chance to address that because I think there's been some misconceptions about who Marina's voters really were. Um, in 2010, um, about two out of every three Marina voters voted for José Serra in the second round. So in other words, the idea that they were going, to, they were disaffected pechistas who were going to go back to, back to the PT in the, in the runoff didn't really turn out to be the case in 2010. Right, so Marina's voters were um, overwhelmingly urban uh, voters with higher education, uh, overwhelmingly. So the uh, the places where she did best were the Distrito Federal, which she won, 2010, Belo Horizonte, which <laughs> Ayesio Neves' hometown, which she won uh, in 2010, and uh, in the entire Zona Sul of Rio, which she was by far and away the most voted uh, candidate. So it was not a typical Peite base even in 2010. In 2014, I think that it actually evolved into a little bit more of a, hard, a harder core opposition voter because uh, it, the positions that Marina took in 2014 actually uh, made it easier for her uh, for the PSB, which was her party this year, the Brazilian Socialist Party, uh, which has traditionally been a satellite of the PT, was led by Eduardo Campos, who decided to challenge Dilma. All right? Going back to Eduardo Campos, he was not really running for president in 2014. Right? He was running for president in 2018, but he was using this year's election as a way to nationalize his name, increase his visibility, and he had every reason to do so. There was no cost to doing that. Uh, but the PSB, 
uh, accepted Marina as Eduardo's replacement, and then endorsed Alessio in the second round. So the, the vote exchange that you talked about actually goes in both ways, right? I mean, I don't think that um, the fact that uh, Alessio was in the runoff made that much of a difference, uh, frankly, because in the end, most of the people around Marina were kind of fair weather Tucanos. I mean, they were people that were close to the PSDB and then, uh, you know, were in the PSDB as well, but were easily uh, uh, swayed to vote for Ayesio Neves. So, for example, if I can take one name, you may not remember this name of Luisa Erongina, one of the founders of the PSB. She was a PT mayor of Sao Paulo from 1988 to 1992, and she comes from a, a Marxist wing of the PT, right? She was disgusted by the decision of her party to support Ayesio Neves uh, in the runoff. So uh, there, there was some dissension in that party, but um, in the end, Marina was a pretty loyal ally of Ayesio in the second round. And I think the idea that Marina's base is in the PT voters, I think that we need to lay that to rest now. Professor Amarra. Tim, it's great having you back here. Thanks. Frank, congratulations on this initiative. It really is a long time in coming, so delighted to see it. Tim, you've spent uh, a lot of time uh, talking about uh, the, the importance of, of social policy. And, uh, and really, a lot of the studies, World Bank and, and others, have basically said that, you know, the, the Poverty reduction has largely to do with some of the social policy. And, but your hypothesis is that, in fact, uh, it's, while well, they're important, that really most of it is due to the to minimum wage. All right? Now, given that the boom is over, right, how much longer can this minimum wage policy continue? especially increasing minimum wage you know, at, at a much faster rate than the economy is growing. Yeah. So where is the subsidy going to come from and how sustainable is it? Great. That's a great question because that's the question that really we should be putting <laughs> to the Dilma government uh, in the second round. But let me go back to the, to the, the social transformation uh, of Brazil. Um, Bolsa Família is extremely visible, right? Um, and it has a very high sort of name recognition. Uh, poor voters know about it. They use it. They, if, if, even if they don't personally receive it, everybody knows somebody who is a beneficiary of Bolsa Familia. It operates with an ATM card. It has an 800 number of Brasilia on the back. It's clearly a federal program, right? This has totally changed uh, the politics of social policy because for 500 years, it was the, the prefeito or the governador, somebody like that, who was always the intermediary of benefits. And that's no longer the case. Bolsa Familia has cut out the middleman, and uh, so that has diminished clientelism in Brazil to a certain extent at the local level. But at the same time, it's made voters very clear that this is a federal program. So it's, that's why the voters have rewarded the PT for the presidency. They haven't rewarded the PT for any other race. So this is one of the, I think, the big differences. If you decompose the reduction in poverty and inequality, you find that uh, minimum wage policy is probably explaining something like 30% of the reduction in poverty. Bolsa Familia between 20 and 25. So they're close, but minimum wage is more important. There are two other factors, probably uh, generally rising educational levels, which is a, a, a slower moving factor, uh, student retention, that sort of thing. And then the uh, increase in labor sector formality in Brazil, right? This, for a long time, the informal sector was growing, and now it's swinging back the other way. The formal sector is growing. Uh, I've asked many Brazilian economists to explain that to me, and nobody really seems to know why that's happening, right? Why are more jobs being created in the formal sector when employers pay through the nose to create those jobs, right? It probably has to do with generational replacement, as a people... Uh, that are coming in uh, as, as managers and firm owners now have been grown up under the Constitution of 1988. They, they recognize the, the benefits and they, they're less likely to violate the law. I, I'm guessing that it's, part of it is cultural. But it's not very well explained, uh, but formality is, is rising. Your question is basically, how long can this last? Um, I think that this is a really difficult crux, because I pointed in my presentation to um, increasing uh, household indebtedness right? So you've got 60% of GDP now outstanding uh, credit. Um, you've got uh, this credit bubble looming over ordinary Brazilians. There was a poll this year by Ibope about um, showing something like 75 to 80% of people in class say, 
are saying that it's hard for them to, uh, to pay their monthly installments for loans and things like that. So we know that people are beginning to feel it. So you're caught between two things. The minimum wage policy has to be raised above inflation and to avoid the credit bubble uh, exploding. So you're in this kind of uh, vicious circle. I don't really know how it will be resolved. Um, Joaquin Levy, the new finance minister, he made noises in the past before he was in government that the minimum wage policy would have to be rethought because you can't have a country in which minimum wage policy is completely delinked from productivity. Productivity doesn't rise, the minimum wage rises. This is going to create distortions uh, in, the, in the market. But politically, to change this policy in Brazil is impossible, right? The legislation that increases the minimum wage, it works like this. Every year on January 1st, the minimum wage goes up by a formula, which is um, last year's inflation rate plus the GDP increase of two years prior. So if last year's inflation was 6.5%, GDP was 2% the year before, 8.5%, it goes up. That's legislation. Um, and uh, he would like Congress to rethink that, but Jilma has already said, uh-uh, we're going to continue. So there's no answer to your question right now because we just have to see how the spiral plays out. But I think that the credit bubble and the minimum wage are going to hit one another sometime in the next couple of years. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was yes. just wonderful and full of good humor. Uh, and one of the things that I heard a lot about uh, during the campaign, at least from my friends and looking at the press and so forth, was the uh, the Estado laico. <laughs> and you didn't say anything about religion in the campaign. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Marina, although it seems strange uh, to us, is an evangelical. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about uh, that effect on the campaign, please? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the silent revolutions in Brazil has been the shift away from uh, Catholicism to Pentecostalism, right? So, and the numbers are getting really, really interesting. Uh, so, the 1980, you know, census, like 91% of Brazilians were Catholics, and then the next one, it was 79%, and so on. But uh, the numbers are changing so fast that you can't wait for a census to ask this. I mean, the Folha de São Paulo does these polls frequently, and the last poll I saw was 57% of Catholic identification now, 57% and 28% for Pentecostal. I'm sorry, for Protestant. Because uh, out of those 28%, about 25, 26 would be Pentecostal and there would be one, two, three percent of mainline uh, Protestants who've been in Brazil for 100 years, mostly German, Lutherans, that sort of thing, but some American churches as well. So th this is something now, like instead of like a 10 to one ratio, it's a two to one ratio. Uh, and this is beginning to, to change uh, politics. I mean, Marina was a, uh, been a Pentecostal for a long time. I, I can't remember exactly when she converted, but it was before she even entered uh, Congress. So, and Benedita da Silva, also from the PT, is also a, a Pentecostal as well. Uh, these are women who um, you know, were able to uh, adopt the social, socially conservative line of the Assembly of God Church, in the case of Benedita da Silva, and they were able to, you know, to live within the PT. The PT was a big tent. Uh, Marina was very careful in this run for the presidency not to link herself too uh, closely to the uh, Pentecostal cause. And in fact, if you think about um, what was the, the predominant push of Pentecostal pastors in the election, it was not for her. It was for Jilma, because Jilma had made arrangements with the two largest churches, Assembly of God and the Igreja Universal do Reino de Deus, IURD. Both of the main uh, pastors, uh, both of the main churches had uh, sort of suggested to their pastors to vote for the reelection of the government. So there's this thing called the, the Bancada uh, you know, Evangelica, uh, the Evangelical Caucus in Congress. It's not clearly linked to any p particular party. There's a couple people in the PT in it, there's a lot of people in the PMDB in it, but there's several other parties. We don't need to go into the acronyms PRB, PR, <laughs> PROS. Uh, they're all. Uh, you know, wholly owned subsidiaries of these churches. <laughs> um, and so the, the impact was rather diffuse, but it really, uh, if there was an impact in the election, it was in favor of the incumbent, right? It was in favor of the incumbent and not, uh, Marina did not actively mobilize uh, the Pentecostal churches on her behalf. In fact, going back to the stereotypical uh, Marina voter I talked about before, that's the one thing they don't like about Marina. The people from Zona Sul or Belo Horizonte and Distrito Federal, 
they love Marina because she's a good government reformer and she's green and she's in favor of uh, climate change legislation, et cetera. She's a woman, she has a compelling personal story. They don't like the fact that she's Pentecostal. Well, I wouldn't go that far to say, but she, she has... Uh, she has allowed herself to, uh, to be surrounded by some who, who have made homophobic statements. Yeah. Well, Tim, uh, I know it's, m oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Hello. Hi, my name is Heather Kaiser. I'm a LAC alumna. And uh, Dr. Power was my thesis advisor. <laughs> and um, you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> It has been said that in terms of the environment, this has been the worst administration in Brazilian history. <laughs> With um, uh, fast tracking uh, infrastructure projects and deforestation and this dam, the Belo Monte. Uh, what do you think about that and how that might result in being a challenge for her in this coming term? Great, thank you, Heather. Heather's one of my best students at any university, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> um, so what is the impact of the environment, uh, uh, of this government on environmental policy in Brazil? Um, since the last question was about Marina, I think I can st start with that. I mean, why did Marina Silva run for president in 2010? Uh, in a way, uh, it's because of the schism inside the government over uh, environmental licensing, right? Because in the Lula government, there were two uh, powerful women at the cabinet table. One of them was Jilma, who was the chief of staff, one of them was Marina, who was the Minister of the Environment. Um, you know, Jilma's pet project was the PACI, the Programa de Aceleração do Crescimento, which is a huge infrastructure outlay program, billions of AIs. And for that to take effect, Jilma wanted to relax and accelerate environmental licensing. Uh, many people accused her of just wanting to rubber stamp everything, Belo Monte, but lots of other projects as well and Marina Silva uh, insisting that the legislation be followed, insisting that the Ministry of the Environment be taken seriously, et cetera. They had a falling out around 2008, um, and since then, things have been very bad. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, Marina Silva left the PT, joined the PV in 2010, ran for president, and there's been bad blood between. I, I think that the, the schism within the government is over because there's no Marina Silva in the government anymore to have that kind of position. Uh, Jilma's, you know, got her vision of streamlined environmental licensing, uh, lip service to the environmental movement, but a very sort of uh, managerial, bureaucratic, technocratic approach to, uh, to developing Brazil through infrastructural outlays. So I think really that the victory inside the government is over. The, vict you know, the, the, the conflict in society remains, but I wouldn't expect uh, any change of course from Jilma in the second term on that. Um, she has other fish to fry. <laughs> I don't see anybody. Well, again, um, oh. <laughs> sure. I'm Fabian Villa. I'm also an uh, alumni. And I had a question regarding the electoral credibility of the, the institution that is in uh, Brazil. We've seen a trend in Latin America of a questionable election. And mm -hmm. I just you know, wanted to see, have an overall general uh, information about how the, the Brazil is. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll repeat the question. The question is um, in terms of uh, the credibility of the electoral management authorities in Brazil, how would, how would I rate that um, compared to other countries? I, I would say that um, under the Constitution of 1988, uh, the the fourth branch of government in Brazil, which is the electoral justice, the Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, uh, and the 27 regional ones, they have gained immensely in every way, um, in terms of uh, professionalism, efficiency, uh, budget, but generally legitimacy. Uh, I would say that uh, in Brazil, the TSC is one of the most legitimate uh, public institutions. If you uh, survey the public, um, it's always the, you know, uh, the military and the churches are highly, you know, everyone else fares <laughs> very poorly, you know, like parties, Congress, things like that. But the electoral justice uh, in Brazil is perceived as being very uh, impartial and also uh, a technological uh, innovator, right? So, I mean, the, 
the votes we talked about, the votes that were cast on election night, uh, 110 million votes, they were all counted by 8.30 in the evening uh, through an electronic uh, system that has few rivals uh, in the world. When the, the, the electoral justice is called upon to interpret a rule or make a decision, they do so extremely uh, efficiently and quickly. Three judges on the electoral court also sit on the Supreme Court, so there's a dialogue between that and the constitutional uh, body. So I would say that um, you know Brazil has a lot of administrative problems, but the electoral justice would not be anywhere near the top of that list at all. I think it's a quite legitimate authority. Thanks. Uh, Tim, I know it's midnight for you, <laughs> uh, and, and you did great. Uh, please join me in thanking you again, uh, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us, as I said, on this very special sort of day and event as we launch the Brazil Studies Program. As I, as I mentioned, please follow us, uh, look us up on our website and, and, and Facebook. We'll be posting now, uh, as I mentioned, the white paper in English and Portuguese here next week. And I hope to see you all in not just the Brazil Studies programs, but in all the programming that LAC does throughout the year. So thank you again. Now, oh, most importantly, we have a reception, food, and drink in the back. So please, please stay and eat all the food. <laughs>